the coffee, all your caffeine levels and things <coughs> are at the right level again. Um, uh, we are going to listen to Anthony in a minute. But before that, I just want to say that at the moment there is a piece of paper going around which Wayne was describing earlier, where you can indicate whether you're going to be here for the Friday evening meal or not, and also whether you would like to stay uh, during the night on Friday night. Uh, so just pass it around and, of course, also uh, yeah, indicate as well what you're going to do. Anthony, thank you so much that you're here to share with us. Would you like to introduce yourself briefly? Yeah, well, um, I'm Anthony. Um, I was born in Bradford, West Yorkshire, this not Brummy accent. Um, I've been here for 34 years, as they say, you can take the man out of Yorkshire, but not Yorkshire out of the man. Um, so I'm still very much a, a West Yorkshire Chapel Methodist person. I work for the Methodist Church of the West Midlands in, in what we call the Learning Network, so I'm a Learning and Development Officer. Um, I'm also um, an honorary member of staff of the University of South Africa, where I'm a, an extraordinary professor of theological ethics and a research um, fellow there. Um, and I edit the International Journal of Black Theology. Well, thank you so much. Um, well, you just, uh, just share what you've got to share with us. Yeah, thank you. Okay, so the title of my paper is Borders, Brexit and Britishness. Um, so it's two, well, first a bit of information and then point of clarification. So, so this paper is taken from my forthcoming book called Theologizing Brexit, a liberationist and post-colonial critique. And that will be published by Routledge, and that will be out next May, I believe. So it's called Theologies and Brexit. And the book as a whole, and this particular extract that I'll read now, is not actually about the European Union. So, so the arguments of whether we should be in or out of the European Union do not come up in the book at all, although clearly, if you read the book, it's obvious that I did vote Remain. What I'm actually looking at are the underlying theological issues that were raised by the Leave campaign and the Brexit phenomenon as a whole. So I'm looking really at the subtext of the referendum, which really was, I think for me, about what kind of nation are we? And where do we sit in relationship to our history in terms of English slash British exceptionalism? Notions of manifest destiny and the role of empire, colonialism, and imperialism on shaping our national identity. In 1857, the famed British explorer, Stanley Livingston, in a talk at Oxford University, said that the British Empire was founded on the three C's, commerce, civilization, and Christianity. Commerce, in terms of the Protestant work ethic, in terms of the belief in productivity, particularly from the subalterns in order to make the metropolitan centre, i.e. Britain, rich. Civilization, the notion that one is doing something of moral improvement <coughs> to those benign individuals on the receiving end of British Empire indeed the white man's burden. And the first two underpinned philosophically and theologically, morally, by Christianity, in terms of mission Christianity, that sought to reproduce English slash British social mores across the world. <coughs> so the work I'm doing is not, it's not pretend to be neutral because I am a, I am a child of empire, a product of empire. My parents came from the Caribbean island of Jamaica to Britain in 1957. They came as British subjects with blue passports, having been socialised into a form of English Christianity that had been bequeathed on them and to them by missionaries. So my central argument is that what underpinned the Brexit phenomena was an unresolved set of religious and theological ideas that have helped to shape the national identity of this country. The roots of Brexit, I believe, theologically, lie in the growth of English nationalism that had its initial flowering during the reign of Elizabeth I. 
the rise of the fortress islander mentality that sees us as different from them really begins during the reign of Elizabeth I. This is not in the text, but it's just worth noting that prior to Elizabeth I, certainly in terms of her father, Henry VIII, we were still connected to Europe, particularly France, by the belief that English kings still contested the notion that parts of France belonged to Britain. So Henry VIII, therefore, I think, was the last king, I believe, to go to France to fight a war in order to reclaim bits of France for Britain. Elizabeth I, therefore, his daughter, second daughter, is the first monarch who is the monarch of an entity of Britain that is, that is complete in and of itself. There are no foreign territories that we see as being intrinsic to Britain, that Britain is an island and nation. And, of course, what underpins that, as we'll see in a moment, is the development of English Christianity. That what immediately separates us has been different from and sub in the subterranean theology of election, superior to, is the belief that God has bequeathed on the British, particularly the English, a special relationship. And a relationship that is proved by the impact of empire. So the rise of English nationalism, based on notions of being different to better to others, is is put, not so, it is predicated on a subterranean theology of election that identifies whiteness and Englishness as the, as the defining symbol for the construct of righteousness as a signifier for religious acceptability. This theological underpinning of English nationalism is a conflation of empire, the Church of England, and conservative politics. Is it any wonder then that the trigger for the referendum vote emerged from the discontentment of English nationalism from within the Eurosceptical wing of the Conservative Party? Historically, one third of the religious and political repository of the establishment of English nationalism, the other two being whiteness alongside the Church of England. And, and the work done by Linda Woodhead is shown quite clearly that Anglicans well, amongst the Christian community in Britain, the ones most likely who overwhelmingly voted to leave, more so than any other aspect of, the, of, of Christian identity in Britain. Essential to the development of the populist thrust of British, more specifically English nationalism, and I move interchangeably between the two, because, and, and as many of us, and hopefully it's one of the conversations that will come out in terms of how other aspects of the British corporate identity figured in this. But I think there's a specific thing about the Englishness that often, unfortunately, gets conflated with Britishness at the same time. So in the book and in this paper, I move interchangeably between the two. But if you would push me, I would say specifically English rather than more, more, Brit more generally British nationalism. There's the conflation of religion and economic and political expansion abroad, namely the link between Christianity and empire. I believe that one cannot understand the development of, of Brexit, the phenomena within, if one is not cognizant of the creation of empire and the process of colonialism beyond our shores of Britain. So my assessment vis-a-vis -vis the <coughs> development of Brexit commences with an assessment of the colonial context in which Christianity in Britain is deeply located in the construction of bodies of particular groups of people as other in faraway places from the British shores. The relationship between empire and colonialism in many respects remains and continues to be the unacknowledged elephant in the room in much academic theological discourse in the UK. Arisugga Tharaja, the doyen of post-colonial biblical hermeneutics, once noted that the relationship between British Christianity and empire is one that is suffused with a collective sense of mutuality. For both the Christian faith and imperialism and the regimes that connot the latter do so on the basis of presuming themselves to be superior to the phenomenological entities they are seeking to usurp or supplant. Speaking with particular attention to the question of empire, Sugathoth Raja writes, and I quote, Empires are basically about technically and military advanced superior races ruling over inferior and backward peoples. When imperial powers invade, the conquered are not permitted to, to be equal to the invaders. This was true of all empires, from Roman to British to American. The basic assumption of superiority is never questioned in their writings. End of quote. 
So the superiority of Britain, particularly English, is built upon a bedrock of Christian-inspired notions of exceptionalism in which God has set apart the British, particularly the English, to occupy a special place in God's economy. One could see elements of this we could see elements of this in the rhetoric of Britain's greatest writer, William Shakespeare, who in his play Richard II, written in 1895-96, a few years after the Spanish Armada. And it's very interesting that there's interesting, you look at the, the rhetoric around the Spanish Armada, compare that to 1940, and Britain's mm. repellent of Germany at Dunkirk, and there are interesting parallels in terms of how English nationalism is playing out in terms of this border nation island nation, with the presumption of God on our side, fighting against the other. So, so Shakespeare's play is written a few years after this, and states in, un un in unambiguous terms the import of the English when thinking in terms of their sense of exceptionalism. And this speech we all know very, very well. Uh, sadly, I'm not Lawrence Olivier. <laughs> this royal throne of kings, this sceptred isle, this isle, this earth of majesty, this seat of Mars, this other Eden, this demi-paradise, this fortress built by nature for herself against infection and the hand of war, this happy breed of men, this little world, this precious stone set in a silver sea which serves itself in the office of a wall or as a moat defensive to a house against the envy of less happier lands. This blessed plot, this earth, this realm, this England. The outworking of this exceptionalism was the desire to, to export the superiority of the British across the world. Empire and colonialism found much of its intellectual underscoring on the basis of white Eurocentric supremacy, which marked the clear binary between notions of civilised and acceptable over against uncivilised and transgressive. Therefore, there's no prizes for guessing on which side of the divide black people my ancestors, for example, found themselves. M much of the epistemological weight for the buttressing of colonialism when approached through the refracted lens of Christian faith has been the seemingly invisible trope of whiteness. I shall return to this point shortly because I feel it is the inability to name and detail the, epistemolog the epistemological construct that is whiteness that is a significant weakness in the scholarship of white academics, particularly white theologians, and their failure to wrestle with the nature of white Christianity in Britain. Just give one very, very quick example. For many years, the church I worshipped at was a Methodist church in Barsall Heath, that at the time of its closing, because we couldn't afford the building, maintain the building anymore, it was a black church. Now, white flight is a common phenomenon amongst all the historic churches in Britain. No one came to create black churches there was something about too many black bodies that scares white people and white people leave out. And yet there's not one major book written by one white theologian that acknowledges what is a, a central reality for every black person living in Britain. Too many of us turn up and white folk leave. And I've yet to meet anyone who's ever looked me in the eye and explained why it is there left. There are always good reasons for doing so, you understand. It's, well, you know, we, it's a bit of travelling to the inner city now. Well, actually, it was a bit of travel 20 years ago before we turned up, but now suddenly it feels more of, a, more of a struggle to turn up than it did years later. Now, to be fair, people have every right to leave for church for whatever reason. So my issue isn't that they leave the church. My issue is that no one wants to talk about white flight. Therefore, if white people turn up, too many of us in the church is a trouble. Then I will also argue that too many of us in the country as a whole has always been a trouble. And it's interesting that good race relations is always predicated on the idea that less people who are different to white people yeah. is always better. Yes. That's a central basis of every notion of, of good race relations. It's not actually maybe white people should stop being racist. It's actually less black and Asian and other people who are other should not be present. Mm -hmm. Quickly moving on because I've probably prepared more than I can read here. So... <laughs> Whiteness as a significant thread in Christianity and Brexit. An important factor in the construction of the Brexit phenomena was the unexplored dimensions of whiteness that have remained unresolved in the British psyche. The concept of whiteness has been, has been, un, has been an underexplored analysis in Britain, particularly in terms of English Christianity and the scholarly theological works that are concomitant to the broader aforementioned phenomena of which this is a part. 
Now, I say it's underexplored. Underexplored in theology, not in necessarily other studies. In terms of the area of critical white studies, is very, very familiar now in terms of cultural studies and sociology, but less so in terms of British theology, done by white people, to be blunt. So my critique of white British theological work, which is ensconced in a, a British context, is that very little relationship has been given to the toxic relationship between British, particularly English Christianity, whiteness and empire. It's rather disappointing, but not surprising, that the theological underpinning of the Brexit phenomena was overlooked in such a myopic fashion. <coughs> when looking at the theological anthropology that underpinned the Brexit phenomena, a subterranean theology of election in which the claims of whiteness and Britishness, ex especially Englishness and God, are unhelpfully conflated. And they become the default marker for shaping notions of exceptionalism and specialism, and specialness, sorry. Th this island nation of Britain is different to and better than the undifferentiated conglo conglomeration of Europe from which this nation wishes to succeed. The rise of populist nationalism in the UK forms the substratum of the Brexit phenomena. The aggressive politics of the Leave campaign and the visceral anti-immigration discourse that underpinned Brexit have been explored more recently by a number of predominantly white British theologians. Whatever one thinks of the merits or otherwise of the Brexit campaign, one cannot doubt the significance of how the Leave campaign was able to tap into a subterranean ferment of discontent amongst white British people, particularly amongst disenfranchised poor white people. The toxicity of the Leave campaign focused a great deal of its invective on the issue of immigration. Ben Ryan, writing the introduction to his edited book, Fortress Britain argues for, the, argues for the legitimacy of interpreting the Brexit phenomenon through the refracted lens of Christian ethics. He says, and I quote, There are good reasons for taking a particular Christian approach seriously on this issue. For one thing, Christianity provides a language in which the British and migrant communities can converse. For the former, although fewer than ever before now self-identify as Christian, the most Recent British Social Attitudes Survey found that 53% of British adults now have no religion and only 41% are Christian. The UK remains a place shaped by its Christian history and values. End of quote. Ryan and the various contributors to this important text provide incisive and cogent arguments for exploring the ethical concerns surrounding immigration policy and the impact of migration on the body politic of Britain. Of particular import in the context of this work are the essays by Susanna Snyder, a former student here at Queen's, and, um, and Mohammed Germer. Snyder's excellent essay outlines biblical and theological perspectives on migration, and she reminds us that, quote, the starting point in any discussion of migration in the Bible has to be that the people of God are migrants themselves. Being on the move is a part of our identity as human beings, and the themes of strangeness, travel, journeying and uprooting weave their way through the Bible as a recurring thread." End of quote. Throughout her essay, Snyder outlines the critical challenges presented by the transnational identity of Christianity, in which the people of God is not restricted to any particular landmass, and in which notions of solidarity are not limited to one's immediate ethnic or cultural group. In fact, in a telling comment, concluding comment, Snyder states, and I quote again, finally, 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 the visio Dei, or the vision of God, reminds us to raise our eyes to see over boundaries, walls, and barbed wire fences we have constructed around nation states, and to revitalize our sense of connection with all people rather than just those within our particular nation. End of quote. Although Snyder does not explicitly name whiteness as a concern, she nevertheless calls into question the inherited theology of election which permeates British, particularly English, identity in terms of its axiomatic sense of entitlement and specialness as a people. Snyder interprets the notion of God's people in its correct transnational identity, countering the more myopic and bounded sense in which it is used as a bulwark for British nationalism. I think the problem with British, and more specifically with English Christianity, is that it is, that it is rarely, if ever, 
undertaken in the way in which the subtextual nature of whiteness and notions of manifest destiny of empire and colonialism are ever taken into account. The issue at stake is not whether Christianity in Britain can and should be contextualised, for clearly it is. For every manifestation of the Christian faith in any particular context represents some localised or some element in localised adaptation of belief and practice, as one would expect in all terms of cultural expression and its relationship to faith expression. Rather, the salient issue for me in terms of my theologising on Brexit is the exceptionalism of British, specifically English identity, which makes the process of contextualisation a potentially toxic undertaking for those who are black and perceived as other within the body politic of the nation. Alongside the important work undertaken by Ben Ryan in the discourse contained within the April 28, 2018 issue of Crucible, the Journal of Christian Social Ethics, that focuses on, on the issue of popularism. The rise of popularism in the UK is timely one given the obvious rise of its phenomena in the zeitgeist of the nation. There's a great deal, of, there's a great deal to commend in what is a relatively slight issue of this special issue, uh, edited by Richard Sudworth, whose editorial makes a helpful distinction between popularism and democracy. It states that populism exists on both right and left of the political spectrum, mm -hmm. promising new vistas of opportunity harking back to a fallacious past. End of quote. For the purposes of this work, the most telling article <coughs> are the ones by Al Barrett and Jenny Daggers, who are two Anglican theologians. Barrett's article explores, explores the triumvirate of the Occupy movement, Grenfell Tower and Brexit. Barrett acknowledges the complexities inherent within our contemporary epoch, charting the disconnect between supposed elites and the people, which can be seen in the three prevailing moments that are indicative of our social dis-ease. Barrett presents a case for the church playing a more mediating role in the current social political impasse, seeking to become a repository in which competing narratives can be heard and where space is created in order that different voices often neglected and angry voices can be heard. This proposal is a helpful one in that Barrett's point us to the complexities of human subjectivities in the, politic, in the political ecology of listening. And this is something that disturbs the simplicities of cause and effect modes of analysis. In the context of this work, I take this to mean that we need to, the kind of creative, critical intersectionalities of identities and subjectivity that takes us away from the unhelpful and, dare one say, dangerous binaries <coughs> of deserving and undeserving victims and perpetrators that seems to be the toxic discourse expressed within the, expressed within the Brexit phenomena. In this paper, I want to offer creative response, a creative response to white British people's false consciousness around the melancholy, of em and the melancholy to the loss of empire and the, and, the perceived, and, and the perceived diminishing of white English privilege and entitlement that British imperialism provided for the internal self-understanding of the British, particularly those identifying as English. An important rejoinder to, to the article by Barrett is by one by Jenny Daggers that explores Anglican social theology, which seeks to re-envision this important facet of English Christianity via the optics of feminist and post-colonial theologies. Dagger's article is very helpful for this project because it gives, it gives a significant role the Anglican Church played in the construction of English no notions of exceptionalism that are born of an imperial hubris that was expressed in the confidence of mission Christianity and its triumphant recreation of British social mores across the globe. Whilst acknowledging the helpful facets of Anglican social theology in envisaging a constructive and egalitarian understanding of British social life, particularly through the lens of Christian socialism, Daggers nonetheless critiques this tradition for its failure to recognise the deeply embedded tropes of imperialism within its modus operandi. In, extremely perceptive, in, a, in an extremely perceptive passage, Daggers writes, and I quote, Second, there is the, abs the absence of reflection of the significance of the fact that our 19th and 20th century tradition of Anglican social theology emerged at the height of empire. That is to say, it arose in the metropolitan church which had strong links with the colonies in a period of missionary activity that anticipated the collapse of other religions in contact with Western culture in its secular and Christian religious form, end of quote. 
In the challenging critical lacuna in the current discourse around the continued development of Anglican social theology, Daggers asked for a more penetrating form of analysis when she says, and I quote again, but I suggest that we need to go further, not only taking more seriously the long overdue appraisal of the post-colonial effects of imperial history in the British church and nation, but also in raising the question of what sort of Anglican social theology is indicated by the wider Anglican communion, end of quote. So post-Brexit reflections. In the comparant recent, recent furore in the UK around the deportation of Caribbean migrants in the spring of 2018 that seemed to have galvanised the body politic of the nation in ways that proved to be surprising and affirming, was the sense of outrage felt by many ordinary British people at the sheer sense of lack of fair play in deporting these older black British people. But I want to assert that the virulent racist treatment meted out to the black people of the Windrush generation is only the, is only the tipping point of the long-held thrust of English nationalism in which belonging has all been predicated on whiteness. And belonging clearly belongs more specifically to white people and to no one else. So a form of subterranean whiteness becomes emblematic for the socio-cultural and political framing of belonging that constructs semiotic walls and borders within the body politic that is Britain. In effect, the fury caused by the attempted deportation of the Windsor generation was predicated on a semantic demarcation between whiteness and blackness in which the boundaries between the whiteness of belonging and the otherness of blackness of the Windish generation is such that even the normal rules of civility around nationality and common decency were exposed as being illusory. The objectification of blackness is echoed in the media conversations. I still remember sitting and watching a debate on Good Morning Britain between Piers Morgan and names just escaped me, so black Labour woman politician. Woman? Diane Abbott. Diane Abbott. Right. <laughs> and that woman was making the case that this was a viciously racist and xenophobic act and should be, and should be, uh, and should be utterly condemned. And interestingly, Piers Morgan's reply he kept saying, well, yes, but I want you to tell me what levels of illegal immigration would the Labour Party tolerate? And Dan Abbott kept saying, but actually that's a different conversation because these people are not illegal. <laughs> they, are Br they are British subjects. The fact the Home Office lost their papers <laughs> is their mistake, not the people who came and were British. And yet, throughout the, throughout the whole of this utterly fallacious five-minute conversation, Piers Morgan keeps on coming back to talk about legal immigration because somewhere deep in his subconscious, mm -hmm. and the course of many white people being honest, mm -hmm. being black makes you illegal anyway. Mm -hmm. Because really, you shouldn't be here. Whilst being on the back of an empire where Britain felt happy to be at home in lots of other people's countries. <laughs> in the context of this work in theologising Brexit, I have noticed, and I certainly noticed this during the Brexit debate, the distinct diffidence with which the church responded to the phenomena. I did not find <coughs> any church leader who, when I'm who identified unambiguously with the cause of marginalised black minority ethnic people and people from other parts of Europe who were distinctly othered within the conversation around leave or remain. I've sat in me sat personally in meetings and watched and listened to white leaders pander to the toxic rhetoric that othered m minorities, visible minorities in terms of people black and and Asian ethnicity or other visible ethnicities and, and more surreptitious othering of people from Europe in order to placate the wounded psyche of privilege and entitlement. Ironically, they often show more care for dissatisfied and disillusioned, often poorer white people who do not go to their churches as opposed to black migrants who do in disproportionately large numbers. And I say that quite starkly, sat in a meeting in Wigan with a Methodist chair of the district, whose most of his ministry prior to becoming a chair had been working with minority ethnic people in inner city churches. And not once did he say, actually, 
I'm concerned about Brexit because of what it says to us as a nation and the ways in which the rhetoric of othering is largely going without any major challenge in the media or elsewhere. Couldn't bring himself to say that. He was really concerned about all the poor white people who felt, dis who felt disaffected. And I, and I understand the disaffection, but here's the myth of whiteness. I'm looking at the time, so I think I should wrap up. It is the myth of whiteness that then makes poor white people feel that rich, privileged white people really have their best interests at heart because they're linked by whiteness. Only if the false consciousness of whiteness makes you think that somehow Sir Boris Johnson really has your back and really cares for you, and, and so does Jacob Jay, so Rees Mogg. The truth is, poor white people have always had more in common with poor people from other parts of the world. And the fact that we often struggle with low wages is to do with capitalism, not to do with migration. Uh, the central argument is privilege and power of the elite who don't care about poor people full stop irrespective of whatever colour you are or wherever from whichever part of the world you come from. It's very interesting that when I was growing up in Bradford, West Yorkshire, in East Balding, we were one of only three black families on our street that was made up of poor white people. And the reason why I was not surprised by Brexit, the only, the only surprise was it was as close as it was. Because in the time we grew up there, these white people, who were in power for three generations long before we turned up, if you want an example of that, i give you three quick examples. Firstly, Charles Dickens is writing largely about the people who feel alienated and disaffected now. They were, they were alienated and disaffected at the height of British Empire, the height of imperial power. They were still marginalised and disaffected and oppressed. But guess what? There were hardly any migrants at the, at the time to blame it on. So therefore, it can't, therefore, there cannot be some axiomatic link between immigration and migration and poor white people being alienated. If that's the case, then, then what on earth then was Dickens writing about? Mm -hmm. In 1926, there was a march, a huge march for jobs from the north against a conservative government that was marginalising the poor. And guess what? There were hardly any, any migrants in the country then either. It is a false consciousness to other <coughs> migrants as a scapegoat for the disaffected illies that does exist amongst disaffected white people. But the issue is about class solidarity, not around the false consciousness of whiteness. As many poor white people will find out, whatever happens with Brexit, they will be screwed either way because rich white people don't give a damn about them. Your enemy is not the black person or the person from other part of the world that is, that is living next to you. Because actually what you have in common is, com is poverty. The real issue is capitalism and our liberal form of economics that always has particular groups of people as a scapegoat. As the church, our challenge is to speak a gospel of radical reconciliation and a challenge to the false consciousness of fear. Because we, as we know in our, in our scriptures, perfect love drives out fear. You don't challenge fear by pandering to it. You challenge fear by offering truthfulness. And we are better together, if that's in Europe, out of Europe, Obviously, that's an important question, but I think the future of Britain ha cannot be on the basis of Fortress Britain underpinned by the false consciousness of whiteness. Thank you.